Hey, Patrick. Hey, how you doing, Michael J? I'm doing well. Uh, rumor has it there's another Patrick in the room with you. What's going on? This is Patrick Sullivan, in fact, alongside me right now. So all of my favorite magical Patricks are on the other side of this call. So welcome, Patrick Sullivan. Thank you. This is a nice trip down memory lane for me. This is uh, the room that I stayed in for a good month when I first got out to Denver. So some nostalgia value here. But so on top of the people that I'm doing this podcast with, where there is also a lot of nostalgia <laughs> value. <laughs> I love that your definition of nostalgia is like three weeks ago. And <laughs> yeah, well, no, dude, it was like literally eight months ago. Right. I got out here in July and stayed here for a month. And then, Time flies. Yeah, it goes fast. Yeah, I mean, it's still, nostalgia inside of a year is like goldfish level memory. It's a good month. Uh, yeah, it was <laughs> really good memorable. Month. You, were, you weren't here for it. You don't know. <laughs> you don't know, man. It's a good month. You don't know. <laughs> All I know is the last time I was in Denver with y'all, I I went to a bar with Patrick Sullivan and ordered um, like uh, club soda, and then the the bartender refused to charge me. <laughs> And, uh, and I'm like, why isn't he charging me? And Patrick Sullivan is like, because he thinks you're a, you know, a, yeah. a, wimp, a wimpy drinker. But hey, yeah. I think I might have had like a lime wedge in that, mm. in that seltzer water. We do it a little different. Yeah, so uh, we had like a lot of interesting Magic the Gathering events happen recently. Oh, interesting yeah. with an asterisk, including... The banned and restricted updates. But yeah, I guess it's sort of a non event though, right? I mean, it happened, just nothing happened. You know, I I read uh, what Matt Sperling said about it. I actually thought it was so apropos. It's just one of those things where you walk into the room and your significant other is kind of, something doesn't seem right. And you're like, hey, is there anything wrong? And they're like, nothing. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Things are fine. That's, that's how I felt. I was like, oh, this just perfectly crystallizes my feelings on, on the banned list. I, I mean, I don't think they had to ban anything in modern, you know, but... Um, I, I think, think long-term, a lot of the zero, uh, you know, cards like Street Wraith and, and Bobble and Simeon Spirit Guide, like long-term, I just don't know if the format can really sustain with those kind of cards floating around. But there's no... I, I don't think there's an an immediate need to really take action, any action on anything in modern. It is what it is. So, I mean, Street Wraith can't really be that much of a problem, right? Or else they would have, like, had to, to bang the taxi and probe. Eventually. <laughs> so, I hear y'all, but th- this is where I was thinking about. And maybe this is just observational, right? Like, I make the analogy all the time that if we just had black, white, gold standard, you know, like the kind that won three, three pro tours ago, that's just a fine implementation of Gideon. I think Gideon's just like a great medium powered card in that deck. But Gideon's horrible to play against, I feel, when you're playing against it in Blue White Flash or, or Marty Vehicles. And I think that it just so happens that right now Street Wraith and and you know, these kind of zeros are are just helping a Jund deck. It's just like so inoffensive. It's a good deck, but nobody's, you know, crying about it. Well, I mean, a function. A lot of it is just the. Besides the synergies, it's the variance reduction. Like, how frequently are you playing the same game or what feels like the same game against Death Shadow because they're starting on a fifty-two card deck? I know it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's where I think some of the. If there is frustration, it's not my opponent cycle a street rate. This is stupid. But I don't think that's the emotional response. It's just more similar than they do with other decks, and a function of that is the cantrips. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, especially if you think of, like, Traverse the Uvenwald as kind of the Urkan trip, right? Like, right. they get Delirium on turn two all the time, and then, you know, they just they just go to town with their library. So, I don't know. Is that bad? Super, super low Yeah, it, well, it, it's going to get it's gonna get old eventually, right? Like, it's all kind of, it's all relatively shiny and new at the moment. But uh, the way that Street Wraith breaks is, of course, its interactions. It's not like it's just busted the, a three-force Womp Walker for five has the option of if you pay two life, you can get a different option, right? Like, that's not inherently busted. It's just inherently problematic. And it takes uh, the right types of interactions. And it very well could be that the congruence of things like Traverse 
and uh, or potentially delve or uh, death shadow itself. You know, all these different factors add up so that eventually it becomes powerful enough that this is like a, a thing. And if the thing is too omnipresent, too repetitive, too old, I mean, this is a deck that has four Tarmogoyfs, four death shadows, and then it, man, does it have a lot of cards that just draw a different card. And I think that the recursion elements of the deck, like, man, when you have Liliana, the last hope, I think those cards are just a lot more dynamic when you're getting back a thing with a text box. And the presence of Street Wraith makes it more frequently that you're just getting back a cantrip. And I think that, uh, again, adds to, you know, the um, deck. And, and Street Wraith is a huge contributor for those cards having that functionality. Yeah, but either way, there's nothing that needs to be done immediately. I just. I would not be surprised if eventually uh, eventually Street Wraith is the problem. Or Traverse, honestly. Traverse yeah, too. Traverse is, is also problematic. It's just that Traverse actually enables some... Even though like Traverse is like kind of a dangerous card, at least Traverse like aspires to do cool stuff and have variable like some variable things it does from one deck to another. Street Wraith is never the good guy. And also, the, the, the power level of Traverse is very much tied to the things you get to put in your graveyard for free, like Fetch Lands, Bobble, and Street Wraith. So all these issues are intertwined, but I think that Traverse the Evenwald, maybe that card's long-term an issue also, but I think it promotes more dynamic and replayable gameplay, even as a tutor, than Street Wraith and Friends. So uh, this past weekend, there were a couple of GPs. Um, as well as uh, SCG Classic. One First of all, in Patrick Sullivan's home state. I played yeah. in that one. Not well. I couldn't make it out, unfortunately. And by couldn't, I mean didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, I decided I would play all the rounds. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't acquire any more wins after around round four, but I played all of them. Oof. Dude, what happened to your busted, uh, I guess, green uh, Golgari Energy or Aetherworks deck? Uh, I think like a combination of things. I think I, I didn't play very well. Like uh, I had a I had half a camera match, so. which is weird. Um, and then also I don't know, just I just drew the wrong side of my deck a lot of the time. And I think that Wait, your green black deck. Yeah, like Sometimes it, it happens just... when you just like when you have decks that have two different sides, you could draw the wrong side, right? Sometimes like, you just draw Noxious Gear Hulk. Sometimes you draw Island. Sometimes you draw Aetherworks Marvel. I sometimes wish I drew Aetherworks Marvel, but what I would always draw is Ulamog. Man, I, I drew Ulamog a lot. Like, let me tell you something. If you ever, if you ever convince yourself. That you know they they banned Emrakul. Yeah, just replace it with a different Eldrazi, right? No, Emrakul. If you draw a bunch, you just cast it and destroy your opponent. Right? Yeah, Ulamog, I mean, you're like, all right, I'm in a lot of trouble here because I got three of you in my hand. But I'm gonna play this so that I can hit ten lands on exactly this turn and be alive. And then you hit your tenth land, and it's Botanical Sanctum. That's the kind of day. That you have when you draw your Ulamogs, but that's only the kind of day you have if you fill your deck with Ulamogs. So, you know, yeah. if you're if you're always playing four turn games where you just go, you know, uh, lay of the land, whatever one you have, uh, puzzle knot, use the puzzle knot, Marvel win on the fourth turn. You know, that's fun, but that that happens so much in game two and three for me. Yeah, it's like the reverse phenomenon of the Affinity player complaining about top-decking the Ornithopter. It's like, I know an easy solution for this, and it's <laughs> to put, not put Ornithopter in your deck. And then you just stop drawing it. It's the easiest way. Yeah, so, I, yeah. You can't win them all, or any at all, in, in my <laughs> case, on Saturday. But it was super fun. I actually, am, I'm really glad. I, I had a great time. Like, I uh, hung out with KYT, who I never see because he lives in Canada, and, you know, other folks who are out there. And, um, you know, I would have liked to see some different things happen at the tables. But not enough to play with, like, Mardu Vehicles, for instance. <laughs> or Sahili Combo. But, like, definitely would have liked to and also still just revolutionize uh, the format, right? I, I assume that the answer to that question is yes. 
<laughs> Dude, so what about Ben Stark's deck? Is this a new contender? Because, like, obviously there's, like, uh, all kinds of just the same Mardu and Sahili deck. But Ben Stark finished fourth with Jund Energy. So let's let's run through this deck. Uh, this deck is, I think, kind of reminiscent of just a black-green energy, but also kind of reminiscent of a deck we saw at the Pro Tour Top 8, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but with no Fleet Wheel Cruiser. It's got 27 creatures, uh, including lots of energy creatures, right? Green Belt Rampager, Long Tusk Cub. Uh, then it also Blind has... Constrictor. Yeah. It's also synergy. Riskar Synergy with uh, the Constrictor. And only two Verderous Gear Hulks, uh, but you know, also Walking Ballista Synergy. It's got a Tuneth Aether for more energy. It's got Aether Up for more energy. Uh, it predictably has Fatal Push, but the, the thing that makes this deck so different... The card that we said should be banned last week and then wasn't banned. Good enough to add a third color, Unlicensed Disintegration. So it's basically black-green beat down with Unlicensed Disintegration main deck. Hey, what do you think of this deck, Sully? Um, well, it, I, philosophically, I like a deck that's just trying to curve out with a little bit of interaction. It seems like a fine way to attack Mardu Vehicles and the Sahili Rye decks. Um, you have a lot of I mean, no deck is going to, none of those decks are going to be able to ball, excuse me, brawl on the ground with this thing. The creatures are just too large and too fast. So if they have to lean on synergies like comboing you out or getting into the air with vehicles, um, you can really leverage your removal there. So structurally, the deck makes a lot of sense to me. I'm a little surprised that there's no copies of the the 4-3 for 4, the energy dump. Oh, sure. Bristling Hydra. Uh, especially if people are starting to move to to Aetherbolt, uh, to, excuse me, to Dynavolt Tower decks. That seems like a card maybe to add mm. in the 75 somewhere um, because the Tower decks really struggle with that threat. Uh, I also like only two Virtuous Gear Hulks because I think this deck is just trying to optimize for more turn four and turn five kills and trying to just tap out every turn in the first four turns of the game. It's uh, interesting the sideboard having four Glint Sleeve Siphoner and two Lathnu Hellion for uh, a little bit more energy aggro. Like, lean into the energy aggro aspect of the energy aggro deck here. So, I think that this deck is kind of aware that more traditional green-black decks, whichever kind they are, right? Whether they're Eldrazi or whether they're energy or whether they're Delirium or more or or fewer than one of those, um, are less popular, right? Because, A, it's outgunned when it comes to Verdurous Gearhulks. And then B, it doesn't have any way to kind of get more mid rangey in the mid. Like all it does is go to Gonti after sideboarding, which is kind of weak in in um, in a grindy perspective. Considering that uh, the decks that it might potentially be trying to grind with already have Gontis or might already have Glint Sleeve Siphoners, so it's just hey, I don't think other people are going to play this kind of strategy, so I'm going to ignore it. Is that kind of what's going on here? I think so. This deck doesn't seem very well set up to beat a lot of spot removal. It also doesn't seem very well set up to beat Fumigate. I mean, the energy creatures in the sideboard are, are I guess, some attempt to, to mitigate that, and Transgress helps there, too. Uh, but no, I, I think this deck is really geared to beat Mardu Vehicles and the Sahili Rai decks. But other grindier mid-range decks or decks that are loaded up with a lot of removal, I, I would imagine, would be a challenging matchup. I mean, like, he's only got two hissing quagmires. This deck is just sacrificing any aspirations of being, you know, he's he's cutting out of the other the, the other matchups like anti fumigate. Why bother if all you care about is Sahili Rai and uh, Mardu vehicles? Is there an argument to be made that there should only be one hissing quagmire and that there should be a fourth evolving wilds? Uh, other than Aether Hub, like this deck leans on that one mountain quite a bit. And, you know, it's splashing Unlicensed Disintegration is the only red card in the main deck, so presumably you'd want to be able to cast it. And then Lath New Hellion is the kind of card that really rewards you for being on curve, I think. Right? Like, it's it's good whenever, but, like, it's real good if you're slamming somebody um, on curve with it. There's, there, there are 12 red sources in here. Because of a tune with Aether? Yeah. I'm just I'm I'm not contending that I'm I'm saying do you think one hissing quagmire four evolving wilds might be might be a, a potential improvement around it? Um, I, I this is a a gray catchism. If it's wrong, it's not by much. Right. I mean, it feels very thin to me. Um, I think you could justify it either way. 
Um, but I, I don't think it's necessarily like, do we have enough red sources in the deck to function? Feels more of a tireless tracker concession if you wanted to go up to the fourth evolving wilds rather than uh, a mana fixing issue. There's this other confounding variable that if you cut a hiss and quagmire for evolving wilds, sometimes you'll like you'll actually decrease your ability to evolving wilds for mountain because of needing to like on a double evolving wild draw have to get forest and swamp whereas if you had a hissing quagmire you could have got mountain oh that's interesting yeah i found myself in in similar situations where i had uh evolving wilds and uh attuned with aether myself which is like the the way that the the game was going to play out i couldn't search the the i couldn't search for the cards that were in my hand uh, the, uh, search for the mana to cast the cards over my hand because I had to search for the lands that would allow me to make my fourth turn play. Um, like setting up the turn three Rishgar, turn four Verdurus Gearhulk or something? Yeah, like, uh, yeah, so, like that. But I think, you know, something with regarding a mountain uh, in this case. Uh, well, skipping the ability to play uh, unlicensed disintegration early on, you know? Yeah, I love Tireless Tracker. I just would put it out there. That guy is uh he's You've a always workhorse. Liked that. Yeah, he's a workhorse. I mean, I'm, you haven't been wrong yet about liking <laughs> yeah. him. I mean, it's, it's a <laughs> he fine beats people by himself. I don't understand how like I, I guess Ben just didn't want to grind, right? Like the deck is just screaming I don't care about grinding, so um but man, Tireless Tracker, Evolving Wilds. Like, you know, we've all had been there, right? Two trackers and play on turn four, play the Evolving Wilds. Can't even count how many times you uh, you investigate in that situation. So there was a actually a different energy deck, a green red energy deck, uh, over at the, uh, the that actually won the SCG Classic this past weekend in Dallas. Yeah, Josh Newell playing uh, you know sort of the old school style of electrostatic pummel or bristling hydra, but with uh, a little bit of uh, a little bit of sauce because of Aether Revolt in the form of Invigorated Rampage. And then, it's not new to the set, but I mean, just kind of in general, like, given the direction he's going, uh, Rush of Adrenaline. Yeah, so this deck is reminiscent of the deck that Hall of Famer Willie Edel played, I want to say two Pro Tours ago. Um, it's an energy aggro deck uh, that uses a Tune with Aether uh, to make up for the fact that it only has 20 lands. Uh, pretty much all of the creatures, with the exception of Tyler's Tracker... Or energy creatures, right? So it's got Pommeler, Bristling Hydra, the guy that, that Patrick Sullivan mentioned a few minutes ago, Long Test Cub, Servant of the Conduit, and Voltaic Brawler. And the goal here is, hey, the energy creatures are actually pretty good at fighting, right? Like, all of them are, are you know, they get big, they are hard to kill, etc. But you Voltron all these energy sources together with Electrostatic Pommeler and larger than life and other pump spells like Blossoming Defense, and you could just kill the opponent from from one attack, right? It's trivial to go from a creature that has uh, one power in Electrostatic Pummeler, give it plus four, plus four with larger than life, which gives it five power, and then if you double twice, that goes five to ten, ten to twenty, and you can kill somebody all in one big swing. And a lot of, I think, the anemic pump spells that are in this deck that grant trample the invigorated rampage and the rush of adrenaline the the key interaction from the two top decks maru vehicles and uh just guy or four colors to healy decks it's a lot more about blocking than spot removal so this this deck's really in the market to have a variety of ways to can trample the threats because i mean it is playing blossoming defense that card's great at answering removal spells and it's very powerful just on rate so whatever but the, the fringe pump spells, I think, are more about playing over the top of blockers rather than trying to interact with removal because the, the top two decks are, are very long on blockers, at least game one, uh, and not so much on removal spells. What do you think about the choice to use Invigorated Rampage and Rush of Adrenaline instead of Brute Force? Or not Brute Force, but you know what I mean. The, uh, the, the red uh, plus three plus three that gives Trample if it's a... Exactly, electrostatic pummeler. Oh, built to smash. Yeah, built to smash. I, I still suspect that this trample on any of these threats is too key to what this deck's trying to do. Game one, being able to pump the bristling hydra just seems fantastic. Or long tusk cub, they mm-hmm. just get so big so fast. Uh, I agree. I think that these uh, trampoly pump spells are pretty exciting. Uh, the thing that I 
I really liked about this deck is the presence of Life Crafters Bestiary. Like, I feel like this deck can just decide to go into grind mode and then just overwhelm anybody who's trying to play them one for one. I mean, certainly the you know the the post board is is settling in with you know Bestiary and Chandra. I'm sure just coming in all sorts of matchups. Um, I, I don't think this deck really can deviate from its game one plan, but you can. You know, try to set up some card advantage, interact a little bit, and then set up a turn where you have Blossoming Defense to cover their removal spell, a Trample Effect to cover their blocker, and, and go off in one shot. I mean, this one's only got eight dedicated, you know, like truly dedicated pump spells. You could cut those eight for Chandra, Release the Gremlins, uh, La- uh, Life Crafters, Bestiary, Aether Sphere Harvester. I mean, you can get away from some of the pump, and then you just keep the fact that you have, like, energy and pummeler and blossoming defense, and and you just kind of, like, sort of do the Mardu thing where you get a little mid range, I guess, but you can't totally get off it. Can you really not just, I mean, get out of the hatred combo here? Like, take out the the weak pump spells, like uh, the trampoline pump spells and electrostatic pummeler, and then bring larger than life. Yeah, and then bring in, like, Aethersphere Harvester, Lifecrafters Bestiary, maybe Lath New Hellion, um, and, and, and this is contextual, right? Like, maybe release the Gremlins, uh, and then Chandra, and th- I think you could just play a legitimate game against somebody, and my thesis here is that depending on on the kind of sideboard cards the opponent has, the opponent might just be really into wanting to either remove creatures... Um, Prior to you having your turn, right? So, like, they do sorcery speed. I don't know. I'm calling it a fumigate, whatever. Uh, you know, or a radiant flames. So that you can't attack them, you know, with lethal. Or have a bunch of, of spot removal. And that, like, all these pump spells get worse and worse and worse if if that's the opponent's uh, sideboard strategy and they have access to the kind of cards that let them interact in this way. And that you actually get paid off pretty well if you're... If you're going grindy against against that kind of a plan, and, I, and obviously Pumbler stinks if you can't pump it, so you know. My concern with going going that far is there's there's cards like Whirler Virtuoso or even Gideon Allies and the Car, which are pretty trivial to beat if you have a trampling effect, but might lock you out of the game if you don't have access to it, even if you're doing the grindy thing. That's a good point. Well, Tate Brawler has trampled over. I mean, like. Like, uh, the the power to pump Voltaic Brawler, if you have four Voltaic Brawlers still in, and then just, like, a little bit of Invigorated Rampage or something, like, maybe you can, like, keep enough trample so that you don't completely get locked out. Yeah, I'm sure you do some shaving of those cards, because the game's going to go on longer. You probably only want to draw the one copy to set up your turn. Um, but I think bailing on it entirely leaves you vulnerable to a lot of cards that otherwise aren't very good against you. How often do you think Invigorated Rampage is hitting two different targets? Seems sweet. I mean, I feel like it probably happens sometimes, right? Like, you you probably don't have that as your A plan, but just depending on how a game evolves, you know, it might become uh, the right thing to do. I think World or Virtuoso probably makes that more common than you'd expect. Great point. Yeah, Whirler Virtuoso is a real big threat to a deck like this because of how much it just seamlessly lets the uh, copycat deck transition into a very different kind of game plan where they can make up for a lack of removal in some way and just buy themselves enough time to do crazy stuff. Uh, were there any other decks from the uh, the New Jersey top eight that caught your eye? I mean, it, all the rest are. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go uh, yeah. down the list. Sure. I don't know. What about Paul Reitzel's Mardu vehicles? We haven't seen a deck like this before. So Paul Reitzel is definitely the type of guy that I would expect to uh, find a, a, a very well tuned Mardu uh, Mardu vehicles. And his list actually is somewhat reminiscent of one of the white-black decks that... So this style of Mardu Vehicles is one of the ones that we covered in the, um, in the Magic Online Championship Series uh, event last, uh, you know, just not too long ago, a couple weeks ago. It, the, the sort of 
conceit to it is the idea of being plains and swamps with only a touching of red for unlicensed disintegration. You know, get away from Inventor's Apprentice. Get away from uh, the 3-1 veteran motorist. Get away from any of the red stuff you can. Get away from shock as much as you can. You know, getting away from all that stuff and playing a white-black uh, deck splashing unlicensed disintegration that has the intent of being able to adopt most of the white black mid range game plan that I know you've been espousing so much the last uh, the last few weeks. Yeah, so you know Paul's playing basically a white weenie deck, which is the kind of deck that he you know might use to win a pro tour. Uh, and it, it, again, this is actually kind of an echo of Ben's deck, right? So you have a two color deck that is just splashing for unlicensed disintegration. I mean, unlicensed disintegration is a, it's, it, it's a little, it's a little bit much. It's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. Hey, peace, Ollie. Do you think that so? Nothing got banned this week, right? Yep. Would you have banned an unlicensed disintegration? That was uh, Patrick Chapin's uh, suggestion last week. Uh, my suggestion of if you ban exactly one card, what gives the greatest chances? I still think I need nine more. Like, I would need nine bans to be confident that I can make a good format out of this. I mean, Scrap Heap Scratcher's on your list, too, right? So, it depends what the target is or what the goals are. I mean, if the, if the, if the goal was, we're going to ban a half dozen cards and we want to have a much different metagame once we have banned these half dozen cards, then I think Unlicensed Disintegration is an easy card to add to that list. If the goal is, you know does this card meet the burden of proof we typically ask cards to meet to ban it in standard, then I think unlicensed disintegration is, is short of that. And probably any card currently legal in standard is short of that. And that's what's, that's maybe what's complicated. Gideon. Maybe, maybe Gideon. Gideon's, I think. Maybe Gideon. Maybe close. Gideon. Um, but there's different considerations with that one, too. I mean. Like, are you going to fire in and ban a card that's worth 20 or 30 bucks after your last ban hit Emrakul and Smuggler's Copter? So it's not as simple as just... Well, the other one is... <laughs> yeah, is the only... Are the only two, like... Is it Gideon or the card that makes Sahili Rai worth anything? Exactly. So it's super delicate, right? Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's tough. And it'd be um, one thing if you knew for sure it was going to be a slam dunk format. The format will be great. The only thing holding it back is this. But <laughs> <laughs> I would not be confident. I mean, in, in, in Chapin's hypothetical of we ban 10 or 12 cards, I think that's a very different conversation. But assuming we're not talking about a total overhaul, um, I would have supported... I would, I would, I'm on board for no bans. Uh, I tweeted as much when it got announced. Um, not because I think that Sanders in a particularly good place right now, but I think that the bans required as like a first step towards uh, radically altering the format are not palatable for other reasons. What would you ban if you had to ban exactly one card? If I have to ban exactly one card, I would probably ban... I know it's... it's um, I know it's mopey and doesn't necessarily improve the format dramatically. I think I would probably ban Scrap Heap Scrounger uh, because I think it would add an appreciable level of variance to Heart of Kirin, uh, and I think that it could open up decks that just play with a lot of uh, removal spells as a baseline way of interacting with Mardu vehicles and with the Sahili Rai decks. I think Scrap Heap Scrounger is a, a huge part of Heart of Kirin's overall power level and a big contributor to you can't really lean in on a lot of removal spells as interaction because you get swallowed up in the long games by that card. Chapin, what would you ban if you only were banning one? Either Scrap Heap Scrounger or Unlicensed Disintegration. It depends. Like, I think Scrap Heap Scrounger is the more reliable that uh, the format isn't going to get worse if you ban Scrap Heap Scrounger. <laughs> like, it'll be... Like, I, like, whatever it is now, it will be better if you were to ban Scrap Heap Scrounger. <laughs> But uh, if the I'm not sure how much how that compares to unlicensed disintegration, which I think is having more negative of an impact in some ways that are variable. Where if you got rid of unlicensed disintegration, it might just not particularly matter. Also, it might be worse. However, there are a lot of worlds where it's the best thing you could do. So I think it's confusing to me, but I think Scrap Heap Scrounger would probably be the safe pick. So uh, Patrick Sullivan once accused me of thinking about magic only as an intellectual exercise and not respecting, you know, the value of collections, for example, right? Like I just play whatever thing that I, I think is best and have, uh, you know, 
the contacts or whatever to, to, to get the cards that I need to play in my deck. Uh, but I think that if I were only going to ban one card, in that spirit, I think I would ban Gideon. Uh, <laughs> And, and that's as an owner of four Gideons. That I would like, I, I find Gideon to be so oppressive to play against, and I never felt that way before. I mean, I did kind of feel that way. you got a big future in the game industry, Flores. That's I can already tell. But no, I mean, your, your perspective has always been about, you know, like, what it seems like you, what you're most interested in is more about breadth and depth of the experience and the possibility space more than are the play patterns particularly fun. And it doesn't surprise me that Gideon would run a foul on that test because it does. I think the gameplay of it fundamentally is is abstractly pretty good. It's oh, about yeah. attacking and blocking. Pretty the, good. The rate's just too much, and it crowds out other cards that could potentially be played were Gideon not present. And I think that kind of card is a lot more likely to offend Flores' sensibilities than mine. The the thing that I don't like about Gideon is that. Unless you're playing a deck, and so this is like it, it speaks to the restrictiveness. I think, in some degree, of how the of how the format has evolved, is that if you're not playing with like a bunch of haste guys, right, like Heart of Kirin or Fleet Wheel Cruiser, uh, or you can't trample, or you can't fly, or you don't have three ones on the first turn, or you don't kill your opponent in one move, it's really hard to deal with. There's no there's no good tools to deal with it, and it creates this zone where, like, it becomes kind of, I don't know, black and white. Uh, and I think it removes a lot of the potential richness of the of the format because you can go down this line of, like, I'm reasonably answering all these other things that my opponent is doing. Oh, wait, how come he can... His guy, he still has awesome threats. He can still crew his heart. You know, like, I can't even deal with that thing. It's indestructible. Like, those are all the things that go yeah, through but your head. Aren't you just speaking to the rate? Like you would have no problem with Gideon if Gideon costs five, right? No, yeah, I would. Yeah, I wouldn't care at all if it costs. But right, if it so costs we're five, just talking about the rate, not the it, play pattern. But if it costs five, it wouldn't even make it into these decks. So, right, but like, so if you look at Scrap Heap Scrounger, there are plenty of nerfs that you could imagine to Scrap Heap Scrounger that you would be like, well, I'll still play it, right? Or if you look at Unlicensed Disintegration. If you were to ban it and they just replaced it with other removal spells, the other removal spells would be weaker, or else they would just be playing them right now, right? Like, they would be weaker, but they are still just going to play with removal spells. With Scrap Heap Scrounger, compared to Unlicensed Disintegration, though, Scrap Heap Scrounger is a... It's a difference in the way the game even plays, right? Like, Fumigate doesn't work. And Scrap Heap Scrounger is, a, it's part of it, right? Like, Heart of Kieran and Gideon are obviously part of it, too. And Archangel Avison. But, like, if you if you change Gideon's rate, it's actually a super good play pattern, right? Compared to, like, uh, I don't know, Felidar Guardian, for instance. Because you do play some games against cards like Obnixilis or Sword and Grim Nemesis where you get buried by them. But the fact that their rate is... is is less powerful than Gideon's. The fact that they cost five and six means you have another turn to set up your board, or you have, you know, what, whatever. Just more stuff has happened, or maybe they they missed their fifth land drop on turn five, but they have it on turn six, and now it's a two turn delay instead of you know just a, a one minute delay. All these things add up, even though Obnixilis and Soren both have the possibility of running away with games and do some percentage of the time. Uh, it's just the, the rate on the cards are very different. I actually just wanted to acknowledge something about Paul's sideboard because you're talking about Obnixilis and Soren. I love his sideboard. This is a different sideboard than Raptor played. Um, it's all removal and going long. That's all it is. <laughs> it's like, but I like how he can just become like a black white mid range ish deck, right? Like he's got he's got painful truths and Nahiri and it, it's just a, an extra land. Yeah, it's a completely different deck, you know. Uh, and and. At the, even if he's taking out aggro stuff, maybe to strands point removal or something, he's got so many ways to crew the heart because the heart was designed to play with planeswalkers. On that note, I heard a great idea yesterday. I had dinner with Zvi Mashowitz last night. and Nice uh, life. Uh, it was. We we went to the Brindle Room with uh, Matt Wang and, and Brian David Marshall. Um, but anyway, Zvi had this idea. It was I thought it was great, and I actually wanted to try it out. He's like, why don't, why don't the four-color Sahili decks play two copies of Heart of Kirin? 
And then after he said it out loud, I'm like, why don't they play four? Like, they have all these planeswalkers to crew it. And he's just like, if you're in the situation where it's just like your Sahili and their Sahili, you just kill their Sahili. And it actually does all these other things. Like, if you're worried about getting attacked, you don't even have to crew it offensively, your combo deck, right? You could just use your planeswalker loyalty to defend yourself. Or defend I think your Fatal Push. I think Fatal Push is the thing. Yeah, just you turn it on. You don't want to do that. Yeah, it's it's like I mean, obviously people can put Fatal Push to work against your Sahili deck, but the Sahili decks are already playing like a lot of like uh, threes and fours as opposed to twos, and can make it a little bit awkward to try to like push them sometimes. Whereas if you just Fatal Push the uh, Heart of Kieran, it's a pretty big tempo hit. I'm not saying it's like off the table. I think for sure it's a totally reasonable idea. Heart of Kieran's an absurd card, and it. Might just be an excellent way to defend themselves, but I think that would be the number one concern I would have is Fatal Push. I think there's an argument to be made that if they're Fatal Pushing your heart, then, you know, they don't necessarily have, uh, you know, at least the option to Fatal Push your Felidar Guardian later. Um, well, it's not it's not trivial for these decks to enable Revolt on Fatal Push, right? Where Game one, we're basically talking about Ballista, which is already an answer to the combo, and a clue off Braven Inspector, which involves leaving up three mana. So there's a reason they board out the fatal pushes in that matchup. I mean, it does interact with the combo, but I, I think it, it, in reality, fatal pushes more about geared towards beating the mirror match. You happen to backdoor to revolt sometimes, <laughs> but I, I don't think that's really a reliable part of the Marty vehicles game plan. Uh, were you impressed at all with uh, any of the other Mardu vehicle decks while we're on the, uh, on the topic? I mean, not exactly reinventing the wheel. I'm not sure what you mean by impressed. <laughs> I mean, uh, I would like to uh, briefly shout out to Robert Lombardi, who made top eight. I think that's his third top eight. I just wanted to show a little appreciation. Robert's on the First Strike podcast with KYT and Doug Potter and uh, and Brian G, which uh, I enjoy a lot. So I don't know. I don't think his deck is particularly different than the ones that... I want to shout out Jarvis Yu. He's got the uh, the stock Marty vehicle deck, uh, like other people too. But I, I he's just awesome, super dope, super dope dude and player. So great to see him kicking uh, kicking butt. This is a strong top eight. Yeah, it's a lot of, I mean, the finals. What do you think of Corey uh, Corey and Ben finishing in the finals with Sahili, right? Like beating the Marty vehicles decks. What do you? Well, the the real question I have is. Why Why did we get to this point in the metagame where after the Pro Tour, it was just like well, Mardu vehicles, there were four-color vehicles at the time, one of those two, was obviously the strongest deck of the Pro Tour. And then we saw like this kind of rise of black-green, and there was just very little Sahili-Rai combo at the top of the tables versus, let's say, the first week or two of the Star City Opens, where uh, Sahili was a much more... Including like... Blue red control splash and Sahili combo, right? We're, we're much more um, substantial part, but now it's like maybe the number two deck in terms of success and population. Sahili, oh, definitely number two deck. Yeah, so like, but and like black green is like almost extincted. Yeah, so I think part of it is at the very least part of it is just guy, uh, just guy Sahili was the. You know, Sahili deck du jour out the beginning for a lot of players. And for a while, for the first few weeks, we saw almost a 50-50 split between four-color Sahili and Jeskai Sahili. But Jeskai Sahili's weakness is Mardu Vehicles. And so once we arrive at a position where Mardu Vehicles is, like, defining the format, Jeskai Sahili just doesn't really have a spot at the table anymore. And uh, with Jeskai Sahili just no longer existing there was a brief opportunity for black green to rise up but mardu vehicles proved capable of okay well if there's literally just no other prey i'll just have the tools to beat black green it's just nothing and so the four color sahili we're seeing is because it's just much better equipped to uh to be able to try to compete with mardu vehicles and even that isn't like I don't know. It's weird. Like, watching the Magic Online Championship Series, Marty Vehicles performed quite well 
at uh, overall against four color Sahili. Also, like, look at Paul Ritzel's sideboard. What is a black green deck supposed to do against that sort of plan? Where he's just got a bunch of like broad base removal for any sort of threat that you know he's got anguish on making stasis snare. He doesn't really care that much about specific text boxes. That's not a way to attack him. And he can go along with the planeswalkers too. And if your plan is to have quality creatures and some removal spells, like that's not going to cut it against the way that Ritzel sideboard is set up. Oh yeah, he's just drawing cards that kill your cards, and he's drawing three of them a turn. Right. Yeah, and once he starts dropping Gideon or. Soren or Obnixilis in a deck with like more removal than you and then also just has uh, a good mix of things like painful truths or like he just ha- he can just play a fully fully legit black white mid-range deck mid-range game the the biggest difference between the two uh, speaking back to the four color Sahili decks the biggest difference between Ben Friedman and Corey Bellmeister's uh, Sahili decks I think would appear at least on the surface to be the uh, the walking ballista thing. Uh, does that line up with what you guys are seeing too? I mean, there's like the little stuff, like the traverse package, to that it gets Ishkana or Tireless Tracker out of Ben Friedman's list. But I'm actually not so sure that the traverse package matters that much. What do you guys think? I mean, there's a there's a huge difference I think structurally here in that Ben's got three traverse to two a two with Aether. A, he has less access to energy because of that, which doesn't matter that much. But, but B, he only has 19 lands, right? Like that. The you think of a tune with Aether or Traverse of Evolve as being fairly and Oath, Oath of Nissa too. It's worth putting him on the list. The fact that he has nine fixers to do that kind of thing. Yeah, but like the the regular four color Sahili list has Oaths and a tune with Aethers already. I'm just saying, like. You think of these cards as being interchangeable with with a uh, with your second land, maybe right, or your third land, but you have to get your first land. It has to make green, and I think that going from like more than you know more than twenty lands, whatever number you're, you're starting at, down to nineteen, greatly increases the variability of your of your opening hands. Like yeah. this deck has the card planes. Right, like, like whatever you're like opening it is like Plains Mountain, Oath of Nyssa, right? Like this. Yeah, I mean, if you're on the play, you know, discounting Mulligans or whatever, he's he's actually only ninety percent to have uh, to have a green source in his opening hand. So like, only ninety percent of the hands he looks at even have a single green, and that's to say nothing of whether there's enough because like i mean what if he has a green but he just doesn't have one of the cards that search up uh mana but i don't know 90 percent it's not that's not the worst well like this deck actually i think that the traverse package does matter um like it's not that hard to get to delirium right he's got evolving wilds he has a bunch of different kinds of cards right harness lightnings and shocks and enchantments and and whatnot uh and the thing that I kind of raised my eyebrow with that is only three rogue refiners. Like I feel like rogue refiner is one of the defining differences when you talk about Jeskai Sahili moving into four color Sahili. Like it's really awesome at blocking and it actually does all the things that you want a card like that to do in a deck like this. Like even if you're in the mid game and you're just like copying rogue refiners with Sahili Rai, like that is so frustrating to play against. Like not in a, like not in an oppressive horrible way. It's just these are two good cards in your deck and. They act great together, and they're forwarding your strategy. You can get jammed up, though. I mean, I, I cover games in the mocks where this deck just wasn't able to efficiently get all of its resources out of its hands. I, I think that the big thing for me with this deck and, and having access to the, the Traverse package is getting to play an Ishkana main deck. The card is so, so good against Mardu Vehicles. And something that happened that, that I saw a fair bit of at the mocks was you get into spots where this deck locks up the ground pretty effectively. There's a lot of just interchangeable dudes that are really good at blocking. But you can't combo out because of the threat of a removal spell. And someone goes, untap Archangel Avacyn, or is uh, at the end of your turn play Archangel Avacyn, or is just clocking you with a Heart of Kirin. And there are spots where this deck couldn't really get out of that kind of spot, where it, it couldn't cover the removal spell and it couldn't answer the air. And having access to one Ishkana really closes down the, the Mardu Vehicle's ability to just beat you by resolving a stray flyer that you can't answer which which happened more times than the, i was surprised with the by the frequency with which that was happening 
Hey, so Forrest, did you uh, happen to check out Mac Blanchard's Teamer Tower deck? I know this is a, a, a macro strategy very near and dear to your heart, but he uh, he finished second at the uh, the SCG Classic this past weekend with uh, a couple. Uh, a couple slight. I mean, a lot of you know, a lot of standard stuff like the whole Glimmer Genius Harness Lightning Dynavolt Tower Torrential Gear Hulk, yada yada yada. But like, um, what do you think of uh, three Rogue Refiner alongside three Shielded Aether Thief? I think that that gives you a lot of things that you might want to interact with your Pulse of Marasa. Mm. Pulse of Marasa. But you wouldn't play four Rogue awesome. Refiners. I you wouldn't, wouldn't play, play four th- Rogue Refiners for sure. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, this is a, this is a place where I would definitely. I mean, instinctually, I want four Rogue Refiner, two Shielded Aether Thief because the second copy of Shielded Aether Thief is so much worse than the second copy of Rogue Refiner. The burner proof is so high on Shielded Aether Thief being high quality and a card that I I absolutely want the three copies of to replace a copy of Rogue Refiner because of the diminishing return issue. I think that some of these cards are, I I, I think they're real cute. And I think that if I were going to play this deck, I'd probably end up cutting a lot of them before I got to the tournament. Like, like I get why you would want to have a Brutal Expulsion in your deck, right? Dude, balance your Rogue Refiner. Yeah, your I mean, like... Gear Hulk. Go off! And, like, you could cast it, and... You I actually... So, I actually like... Back. You could pick up your own Torrential Gear Hulk with it. No, uh, so, so I actually like Brutal Expulsion in this deck. I think the fact that it, it hits Scrap Heap Scrounger in such a meaningful way... Is seriously more. Va- I think that both Incendiary Flow and Brutal Expulsion don't get enough credit for the value that they, you know, on the margins, the value they give you against uh, Scrap Heap Scrounger. And obviously, if you're playing some kind of a deck that tries to take control or quasi control, like a Dynavolt Tower deck or a Fumigate deck or whatever, then you you end up valuing that stuff a little bit more. But like, if you notice, this deck is real smart with regards to having a a lot of incidental ways where it trades a few percentage points to get a little bit of scrap heap scrounger action, natural obsolescence, two incendiary flow, brutal expulsion, and it does sort of speak to a little bit of the subtle strength of scrap heap scrounger that. Like it's putting pressure on people to have to play options that are not the options they primarily would want to, because they have to have some access to exiling effects. I think you can also talk me into a great. lot of nonsense with brutal expulsion in the deck too. I mean, I, excuse me, with torrential gear hulk in the deck. I think that card opens up a range of if you have four and five mana instants that maybe you can justify the the first copy just as is, and having that as an option to torrential gear hulk back the. Confirm suspicion is much yep. the same thing. You can you can pretty easily talk me into one copy of a lot of expensive instants once you have Gear Hulk in the deck. Particularly when you have anticipates and glimmer of geniuses and so on, giving you extra, you know, a lot of extra looks at a relatively small percentage of your deck. I have a hard time with the three anticipates. Speaking of that, I just uh, I don't know, man. Because so anticipate really does have diminishing returns. I mean, we saw this a whole bunch in a back. In from... Tower deck. It's this a little surprising. Like exactly. I'll give you that. It's a little surprising. Want. <laughs> no, it's a little surprising. I'm saying it's a little surprising. I'm just like, I have I would played normally, I would all normally, the numbers I, of anticipates. I've played zero many times. I've played two. I think this deck wants four, right? It digs into Dynavolt so. Tower on turn three, and it fuels Dynavolt Tower later. So, what do you think of Confiscation Coup? That's a card I've always oh, been interested it is in. The most baller card, man! <laughs> it's really, it's really sweet. It's fantastic. You can take like Aether Works Marvel, right? Aether like, Works Marvel is is on the low end of the things that you can take with that card. <laughs> <laughs> like if you got that you in your deck, Marvel? I mean, certainly getting your Marvel Confiscation Coup is horrible, but like. Uh, uh, the interplay with with uh, with certain decks at the really really high end, like you can actually take Ulamog with that card, right? Like <laughs> you, you you could. It's it's a it's a possible thing that happens. You're you're accumulating all this energy and you don't have to spend it, right? That's a. I mean, I think that Marvel's probably one of the main things you want to take, but it's just. It's awesome. I think that if I were going to play that card, I'd probably play one or two copies in the main deck. Though I think it's like a great. Gotcha card, and I think. Yeah, but you a, don't want that against Mardu vehicles, right? Like it's really bad to draw there. Oh yeah, I mean, but Mardu vehicles are. I guess their creatures aren't good enough that you'd want to spend five on them. 
but the no nah, no nah, not really what? like it's it's not it's, the worst it's not the worst but it's yeah but it's like kind of a i i can't get it's mileage will vary but five is a lot for a sideboard card if you're going to go after a particular target there's almost always a more incisive way to do the to do a relevant thing but there's nothing sweeter than confiscation too i don't know I think that a lot of people that are trying to go along with you board into things like Tireless Tracker or Archangel Avacyn, like, uh, uh, or, um, you know, the 6-5, uh, the, the, the Sky Sovereign. I mean, those kind of cards are just floating around in people's sideboards. They get brought in all the time in, in any matchup that goes long. And I'm sure Confiscation Coup is just great value at tagging any card like that. I only get to shoot the moon with it for it to be worth its spot. If you take a Tireless Tracker, get a clue, and they have to use a removal spell on it. Um, that's a great exchange for five mana. Plus, you never know. Once in a while, you'll play against the person who's just like didn't get the memo, and they just drop Kalidus, and you're like, what? <laughs> "Let me get that. Let me get that off you." <laughs> uh, so there was another Dynavolt Tower in the top eight of the classic, the Jeskai Tower deck, piloted by Austin Maure. Uh Four Torrential Gear Hulk, three Dynavolt Tower, just three. But uh, a lot of the usual suspects. Some of the uh, the usual. And suspect, like uh, <laughs> like brutal expulsion, you know. Like, which anticipates I love. again. It's but like... that's the thing. I want to know where the what's the school of thought on the just. It's just understood. You just have to play. There's three. just some Facebook thread where all these po- <laughs> people are posting their different Dynavolt Tower deck lists. Everyone has three anticipate. Just the, no, at yeah, this it's point, not a you, problem. Once this point has been reached, there's no going back <laughs> because at this point, everybody else already three anticipated for so, so long. I just like to point out that both of these guys have three anticipates. One of the decks has 21 lands, and one of the decks has 26 lands. <laughs> <laughs> So some of it's still up for debate. We, yeah. we, we settled the anticipate issue, but there's still other conversations to be had. That's a lot of variance in how many lands you have. Yeah, no. it's basically the same strategy. <laughs> it really just, it really depends on, like, I mean, for instance, there's one school of thought where you can use shock to fix your mana. Right. Because you just, like, shock their creature, and then maybe you'll draw a land next turn. Right? I mean, if I'm just thinking of myself playing in consecutive tournaments, like, I played 20 lands, you know, 21 lands. That deck had Monastery Swift Spear. I also played, like, 26 lands plus in Anticipate. That deck had Dragon Lord Dramica, right? <laughs> they weren't the same deck. Right. I had never, I have never finished a constructed tournament and thought to myself, I think my deck was five lands short. <laughs> like, like I've been like, maybe it was a land short. Maybe one of my once, never five. five. I had a, I, I had a very memorable experience with Hall of Famer Ulrirade back in the day, uh, and I, it, 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 it always stands out to me. I kind of, I kind of feel like it'd be best to protect the names of the other party, but Ule and this other party have been playing some Type One. Uh, vintage back in the day and uh other party was convinced that them and Ule were just playing the mirror match and Ule's not just sitting around arguing with people he just shrugs and he just doesn't really you know he's not really saying much he's just taking you know getting w's and they play a whole bunch and they lay out their deck to compare the differences without exaggeration Ule's deck was literally eight land more than <laughs> Like, he just has their quote-unquote playing the mirror match. And it's vintage, type 1, whatever, so it's it's weird, of course. But, like, I've never seen two people where one of them was sure they're playing the mirror match and they have eight land different. In their, they, not eight of the land are different. Ule just has 21 land plus all of the Moxes and Lotus and all that stuff, Soul Ring. And his opponent just has 13 and thinks they're playing the mirror match. It was also, it was a different culture as it pertains to mana weaving. So you don't, you don't know what all the <laughs> confounding factors were, right? Like it, 13 could have been correct. Well, yeah, 21. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 13 might have been right. Depending Assuming on what you're that, trying to accomplish. Right. I mean, I depending know. on the pile shuffling rules at the time. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I it, it is funny, the idea of just two decks in standard. <laughs> ah, I go to Torrential Gear Hulk, 26. I go to Torrential Gear Hulk, too. 21. <laughs> uh, so over in uh, Barcelona, there was a, you know, obviously the top eight in Jersey was, like, highly varied. 
with seven Sahili and Mardu vehicle decks and a rogue deck. The Barcelona decks, not as much variety, mostly, it, I mean, it was really just literally four Sahili, four Mardu vehicle, evenly split all the way down. The finals, one of each. Semifinals, one more of each. Quarterfinals, two more of each. Uh, were there any of these decks that really jumped out to you as particularly compelling specimens? Like, uh, I mean, the, the champion, uh, P, uh, Peter Soturik, and I apologize for butchering the name, but, uh, I mean, one Tamiyo isn't even, like, weird, right? Like, a lot of the Sahili decks would be playing the one tam- Tamiyo. And... Yeah, I mean, I, oh, I, I yeah, see Lucas, one Tamiyo all the time. Uh, Main deck Sky Sovereign in Inigo in Inigo Valerio's uh, fourth place list. So explain this to me. I, as I understand it, you're supposed to side the Sky Sovereign in in the mirror match. Yeah, to hit Planeswalkers. All right. Or just the game becomes about grinding people down in the battlefield with Tireless Tracker, and it plays pretty well in those games too. Now what? What algorithm do you use to decide to take out Felidar Guardians or how many Felidar Guardians to take out? Because sometimes people take them all out, right? My algorithm is I usually just take out the correct number for the matchup. <laughs> yeah, it's not, you know, the most formal, but it is, it is a good <laughs> method. Uh, so observing uh, the people playing the mocks, it looked like um, Lucas Bohan, who impressed me the most, at least in terms of play, seemed to feel like you just never cut the combo. He did some shaping, but often it was uh, some of the energy creatures where the second copy isn't that great. So maybe you shave a Whirler Virtuoso, maybe you shave a Servant of the Conduit, maybe you shave a copy of Sahili Rai, and so on. But uh, I, the the better players at the Mox didn't seem like they were ever fully bailing on the combo. So what do you think? Marcio, Marcio Carvalho putting up another big finish. This guy just constantly putting up big numbers, um, playing a variation of the same deck he did so well at at the Pro Tour, same deck he did so well at at the Mox, uh, but each time evolving it a bit. And this time, he he actually went down to one Archangel Avison and split the difference. At the Mox, he had four veteran motorists. Here, he has two veteran motorists, two walking ballista in his main deck. And then he also makes room for an Aether Sphere Harvester Instead of having, like a, for instance, a one-off Cultivator's Caravan. He also, interestingly, goes with three Fatal Push, one Shock. And it looks like this. one of the biggest things is the, uh, the push towards some of the white-black uh, Splash and License Disintegration. He didn't go all the way, but he actually um, ended up losing an important match to Raptor with... There was kind of just a showdown between the white black splash and license disintegration style versus the veteran motorist style. And uh, it looks like here he's actually trying to do a little bit of the best of both worlds approach. I mean, veteran motorist seems like an odd card to go down to two copies of, though, right? Like, it's... well, he's playing three mountains still, so that's the funny thing, right? Like, Raptor's deck's all plains and swamps, and Marcio's deck at the event was mountains and plains. Here, he still has the mountains and plains, but he's just down to two veteran motorists but and down to just one shock. It's this a little is surprising. Like, it's the thing, right? If you're playing with veteran motorists, it's the thing. It's a two drop, it potentially fixes your draw, but it demands so much of you. But to go to two, two copies, I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong. He has a one next to his name. It just seems odd to me that that's the that that's the split. These are subtle changes, but it looks like his change from the mocks is it, the main deck is just trying to get a little bit more game against four colors to Healy Rai. You know, cutting a fatal push and getting a shock in the deck. Going down a couple copies of veteran motorist, veteran motorist to get a couple copies of walking ballista in the deck. A lot of these changes. They feel interchangeable, you know, six of one, half dozen of the other, but they are a couple of percentage points game one against the Healy Rye, and I, it wouldn't surprise me if that's what motivated the change. Yeah, he's always been a big fan of the Oaths, too. It's interesting having both two Oath of Chandra and two Oath of Liliana uh, with only just two Chandras for his Planeswalker cyborg plane. This isn't, you know, like some of the people we've been seeing, like, just loading up. They've got just Soren of Nixilis or whatever, all kinds of stuff. 
Uh, he only goes up to six Planeswalkers after boarding and still wants four, uh, four Oaths. What do you think about that? I mean, the Oaths are great on the front side. Right? Like, you don't have to get paid. I mean, Oath of Liliana is not great on the front side. I think it depends what matchup you're in. Sometimes they only have awesome creatures. That cost two. I Maybe. Mean, I, don't know. I, think people, I, I think people typically bring in Oath of Liliana when they feel like they're going to play against Ulamog. Like, I, I don't know. People, I, I, maybe it's because I always have Ulamog. But I feel like that's when we were casting Oath of Liliana. I like know, after I, the game of the show, I had Oath of Liliana in my hand. You're like, oh, great. You know, that's great, you know. I, I think Riesel has the best approach to the sideboard here of what I've seen. Because the, the, the removal spells he's bringing in are not really that situational. There's not a lot of textures to them. Uh, and leaning on a lot of card drawing with removal spells that kill everything just makes a lot of sense to me. So uh, Joe uh, Joe Jasso, who came in 13th at the Classic, uh, had a, you know, kind of a little bit of a throwback green-black. Back, remember the good old days when green-black used to just, like, cheat, like switch it on them, like, flip mode style every week, where it's like, okay, this week we're energy, this week we're plus one, plus one counters, this week we're delirium, and they're just, you know. So he's got a green-black deck with uh, two catacomb sifters, and then three Nissa Voice of Zendikar. He's even got, and this is old school, he's even got murder in his deck. Look at the mana. Look at the mana. <laughs> you can't, this is, this, like, the only thing better than eight forests, eight swamps, four blooming marsh, four hissing quagmire, is 20 basic mountains, Arabian Nights symbol. Yeah. I mean, that's just like, I mean, he's got tireless tracker and fatal push and cannot be bothered with even one copy of Evolving Wilds. I love this. I, that's pure. <laughs> yeah, I, I I cannot imagine that this is the optimal mana base for this strategy. I don't know, man. He is like, I, I bet his land coming to play untapped. You know, sometimes you want land to come to play untapped. Yeah, but he, has but, uh, oath, like he should have more green because he has Oath of Nyssa. Eh, maybe. He's also got Grasp of Darkness. I said that. <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot of demands. It's not. A, it's not a simple thing. <laughs> but no. In all seriousness, what do you think of the catacomb sifter approach? I feel like it's a little gonna... surprising to me to see a catacomb sifter at all if you don't have four Rishgar. Well, I'm looking at this and saying he's got three Nissa voices under card, three Rishgar, and two catacomb sifter. Right? Like, <laughs> it feel like the catacomb sifter decks. Their entire agenda in life is to land a fast um, Verter Skier Hulk. I feel right. like if you're going to play some mix of those three three drops, you're going to want four of one of them, and I would start with Catacomb Sifter. Like, maybe four, four, and one or something. Wait, you would start with Catacomb Sifter, not Rishkar? Well, I mean, I would also have four Rishkar. <laughs> I'd have, like, four, four. Where are you getting the space? I'm not necessarily defending this split, but there there could just be, again, this is this could just be diminishing return considerations. The first Nissa, the first Rishkar, and the first Catacomb Sifter are all substantially more powerful than the second copy of any of those cards. That's and fair. so you may just want to draw a mix. Catacomb Sifter is sweet with Fatal Push. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like... I don't know. You could talk me into 3-3-2. Three, three, it's... Yeah, I think the diminishing return issue is pretty loud. But I, so, I think that you really want to draw one of them to land Verter's Gear Hulk, right? Like, I uh, think it's okay to have a second Rishkar that, in your hand because half the time they're just going to kill your first Rishkar. Well, maybe. I, I'm not an expert on green black cards. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you check? Uh, did you happen to see. Uh, <laughs> Randall Daniel, uh, a, uh, a week back, week and a half ago, actually uh, came in second at a uh, at one of the IQs with a blue black control deck that was uh, a little bit reminiscent of some of the stuff you were talking about like a few months ago. But it's the terren- you know the the usual just torrential gear hall, tons of removal and counter spells, glimmer of genius. But uh, with uh, two Kalidus and one Jason Raveler of Secrets. Alongside two Void Shatter, two Horribly Awry. And then also. Horribly the- Awry. I, I was, you know, like you're saying, testing some blue black. Uh, I thought that all the cards were awesome and contextually awesome for the format, but, you know, 
all power to, to Randall here. I could not win a match with my <laughs> like ever, right? Like, I'm like, I, I, I thought this is the kind of deck you wanted to be good, you know? Like, I yeah, mean, and I just wouldn't win. Like, this this main deck is really, really similar to Jim Davis's from week one. Yep. I think that this actually the main deck might in fact be the same. I think there's a slightly different split of of the removal spells, but it's very close. Right. The one Jace, the one confirmed suspicion, having a flashback. Like I think horribly arise one of the more underrated cards in the format. It's it's good against basically every deck. It stops the Sahili Rai combo. Um, and it's bad against Verder Gear Hulk, but it's good against everybody who comes before Verder Gear Hulk. It's not the greatest against Gideon or Heart of Kieran or Sahili Rai. That's why you can't talk me into playing a deck like this. Is you have to line up. It, basically, my experience watching Jim was the following things had to happen. You could not miss a land drop for the first eight turns of the game. If you missed one land drop in the first eight, you Dang. were done. And also, if you had the, if you ever had the wrong reactive card lined up against the wrong threat, you died instantly. No hope of catching up. And if you got past those two points, you were probably like fifty six percent to win the game. So that was just, <laughs> that was just asking too much from, so, from what I watched for me to point, be talked into playing that sort of deck. Point a couple things out. One. Horribly Rai is actually pretty good. It's against Sahili Rai. It stops spell at our Guardian. It's not, you know, it's just an answer. But it's great against Scrap Heap Scrounger. Ish. Like, it's, it's great against Scrap Heap Scrounger. Great. If you're on, on the, the way down, but not on the way back yeah. up. Right? It's playable, to be sure, if if everything falls right. But the, the one of the things that, that I had problems with the deck is, uh, kind of what Peace Ollie was saying, you have to hit, like, Maybe not eight. Maybe it's six consecutive land drops or something. Yeah, I think you could seven. totally miss your seventh land drop for a turn. Like, you could stutter on seven. But the problem I had was I'm hitting all these land drops, but my opponents just played two spells in one turn, right? They're like, here's a 3-1 and a 3-2. And I'm like, oh, well, that's clever. I have a three-casting cost counter spell in my hand. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, they just get damage in, and then you have to spend mana on your own turn to kill something, and then they land a, you know, like, play a Cephalitis or something, and then they just land a Gideon and kill you. That's, uh... That, I, I couldn't ever win, maybe. It's I, not, I it know. is not easy mode. If you like, if you really like the experience of playing control, of just swimming upstream for 15 turns, I recommend that deck really highly, because that, <laughs> that is the experience you'll get. I mean, for nine sure hours? That's a, okay. <laughs> I, I would imagine it's positive against Sahili Rai. You have a lot of good answers. You can draw some cards. They have a lot of nonsense and dead weight. But I, I, I have to imagine the Mardu Vehicle matchup is just, for me, would make it a non-starter. I, I think I played my nine matches. I won zero times. It didn't matter. It didn't matter <laughs> what deck my opponent was. They defeated me. I, I might not have won a game. I, I played against Craig Wesco. Craig Wesco was just playing like that style of blue black in our testing, like yeah. before the event, and it was like we went days without him ever winning a game. <laughs> it was just so. Uh, this is a little bit switching gears, but just well, we have well, we are so fortunate to have the benefit of of Doctor Doctor Patrick Sullivan in the room with us. Wanted to see if I could uh, switch gears for a second and look at uh, Legacy, which has had uh, you know there's. I mean, legacy's always it's 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 legacy all the way down, but uh, there uh, obviously no changes to the ban list. And even though people always you know they talk about stuff like uh, since he's divining top or whatever, right? But uh, the most recent uh, classic, uh, the the, le- the most recent legacy classic was won by Daniel Haberick playing uh, a legacy powered Carlos Eldrazi, and we're talking about an Eldrazi. A colorless Eldrazi deck. We're talking about a deck that has no colored mana requirements. So you're already just you're playing a colorless deck, and you don't have room for the fourth wasteland, the fourth Mistress Factory, the fourth City of Traders, because literally all your lands are just di. What do you think about this list? So this is, oh, go ahead. Here's the question that I have before yeah. we get into the, the 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 macro deck list here. Two Simeon Spirit Guide. So there's an argument to make it one Simeon Spirit Guide, one Elvis Spirit Guide to get around Kapal therapy issues. Nice. But if you draw two copies of Simeon Spirit Guide, you can use one to cast the other. Oh. You can't do that with Elvis Spirit Guide and Umazawa's Jute is, is in the deck. Where do you land on this? I am I am way in the camp of two Simeon Spirit Guides instead of uh, any Elvis Spirit Guides. 
at least partially because I think that Blood Moon shutting off your matter reshaper, your reality smasher, your thought not seer. Mm. I really like the Simeon Spear Guide's strength against Blood Moon compared to Elvish Spear Guide. So I, I I'm a fan of this deck. Um, I, you I mean you that... just want to cast a Gray Ogre? That's what you're saying? I'm sure. Well, that... it's, no, no. It's I want to be time clear I'm pitch it for a mana on playing Eldrazi. <laughs> We're just comparing the difference between Simeon Spear Guide and Elvish Spear Guide. I just think Simeon Spear Guide's better in this deck. I, know, I, I hear you. I just want to make sure that that's the reason. <laughs> yeah, well, well yeah, I mean, it's the details matter. Yeah, it all matters. No, I, I just want to know. I'm not criticizing. Plus, honestly, I want them to see the second Simeon Spear Guide and be like, this dude's playing all Simeon Spear Guides and Cabal Therapy me. So I would love for them to name Simeon Spear Guide instead of one of the Eldrazi. <laughs> uh, turn one Chalice for one in Legacy is so powerful that people have played so many horrendous decks to try to get that to happen. Just four, four yeah. City of Traders, four Ancient Tomb, four Chalice of the Void has been the foundation for most of Legacy's most unplayable decks. <laughs> so getting to getting to do that in a deck that actually seems like it can win games outside of having Chalice for one on the play, turn one, uh, is attractive. Because this isn't, remember, this is not just a deck with two Simeon Spear Guides. This is a deck with four Ancient Tombs and three City of Traitors. This deck is playing, like, when it draws its Chalice of the Void, it is playing it on turn one 80% of the time. That, that's it. Yeah, no, I mean, this is, uh, this. Is, I, I don't know if this would necessarily be my thing, but you have Chalice for one on turn one and backed up by a real deck, so... Yeah, this seems fine. What do you think of the use of Zero Walking Ballista, which has never really caught on in Legacy yet? However, in Modern, one of the, the up-and-coming stars has been the Colorless Eldrazi, a very similar style, obviously, with uh, not quite as much juice in the land you know, situation and in a format where Chalice of the Void is not quite as busted. However, in, uh, in Modern, four walking ballistas has proven to be a very powerful addition to the Colossal Eldrazi strategy once it's being powered by Urza's Tower and such. Do you think that the difference in Urza's Tower versus Mishra's Factory and Wasteland is, an, is the difference, or is it just that walking ballista doesn't do enough in Legacy? I think it's both. My, my guess, my guess is, yeah, the Urza lands are a big part of it, and Legacy is not necessarily hospitable to walking ballista powered by Ancient Tomb and City of Traders. Yeah, what thing. do you want to do with the walking ballista in Legacy, Patrick? I want to take two damage, not play any more land, and put a plus one plus one counter on that bad boy. The decks that it would theoretically lock out have a lot of them have access to abrupt decay. Oh, Source of Plushers, too. Yeah, yeah. So, Source of Plushers is a game changer. I mean, I'm sure, would I want it in the sideboard as, like, an anti-death and taxes measure? You could maybe. Talk, maybe. You could talk me into that. Um, but but game one, it seems a little mopey without the Earth of Tron lands. I do love Umazawa Jite in uh, in Legacy, by the way. That one, I, I, I still think that card doesn't get played enough in just, like, incidental usage. Um, there was a Blu-ray control deck played by Jeff McClear, who finished fourth. This one is, I mean, so it's, whenever you see a deck that just has Sensei's Divining Top and no counterbalances anywhere in the 75, it does make you raise an eyebrow at least a little, right? But this is a, this is a blue-red, some cards that are fun to play with deck with um, Grim Lavamancer, True Name Nemesis, Vendillion Click, Jace the Mind Sculptor, and then in terms of the exotic elements, because there's a lot of the usual suspects like Brainstorm and Lightning Bolt and Force Will, Ponder, but the uh, some of the exotic cards in the uh the spells category temporal mastery 2x and burst lightning 2x so if you're going to play temporal mastery so that's the uh the miracle time walk, time walk. right so it's five uu for a time walk but you can miracle it for one uu his, his, his deck's got jace sensei's divining top and brainstorm if you're going to go in this direction is it ponder yeah and ponder isn't two and then million click is something you can click yourself and get rid of that stuff I mean, isn't it an odd number to play? I mean, obviously two is an even number, but isn't it an odd number to play two? Like, I, I feel like if I'm going to go down this road, I want to, you know, go all the way. <laughs> you could talk me into one being correct more easily than you could talk me into three or four. It does have diminishing returns. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like for instance, the games where you just are casting multiple time walks. Honestly, it's not clear you needed the third one, right? Like, <laughs> it's like... How many extra turns in a row? Whereas, 
Like, there are a lot of spots where you just have Temporal Master in your hand, and if you draw a card that does anything, you can, like, get an advantage. But if you just draw a 7-drop, and you're like, eh... And then that's if you have just, like, on the first turn or whatever, because obviously it's nice to draw a Temporal Master later in the game. But in your opening hand, the second Temporal Master you draw is a lot bad. Like, Oh, yeah, really bad. But the deck has Jace and Brainstorm. Like, it can fix its hand. Uh, this is the classic, I can justify any blue spell because I have Force of Will argue. Yes. Just ma- I don't know, magic I didn't even think of that. Sometimes you are right, Patrick. Cards. You could, you could just force with it. Yeah, you could in, just in force with four. It. Yeah, it's a freebie. Just play four. I don't know. Also, mastery already kind of supposes that you were ahead on the board a little bit for it to be really powerful. Um, I mean, it, it doesn't take a whole lot, right? If you have a true name nemesis or a Jace, it's going to be pretty powerful in those spots. But uh, I imagine it's it's only very powerful in games where you're already kind of ahead. And I think just drawing too many copies of it is is an issue. There is this weirdness too, right? Like, like what percentage of the time you're like, yes, I just drew temporal mastery. This is a free roll time walk. I'll attack you with Snapcaster Mage, take an extra turn, and then draw a different card. I guess. <laughs> Dude, that's good. That's like a rampant. Broken I'm not saying it's not good. I'm not saying it's not good. Of course, like literally, do two damage to your opponent, like Street Race. Draw hard. Zero mana, they take two, draw a card is good. I'm just saying that, like... land into play, it's great. Maybe you, maybe you have a land to play. Maybe it matters. This deck doesn't really have any cards that cost more than three besides the... <laughs> I guess it's Jace, but most of the seven drops... Besides are the Temporal the, Mastery. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. Uh, so there's a fourth... There's a, actually a four-color Delver deck played by Steven Mann that, that top eight it as well. That uh, I think kind of brings up an interesting question regarding uh, the whether Delver, like I, I, I sort of see Delver as having three primary paths you can go. There's the like mostly blue red. I'm playing, like I'm really playing into Lightning Bolt with Delver type of uh, action, often with Monastery Swift Spear. Uh, there's a different style of just like. Basically, black green, sometimes black. I'm sorry, black blue, sometimes black blue green. Where you're like, oh, I want to play a little bit more. Uh, I want to play a bunch of real cards. I want to have abrupt decay, and I want to have maybe planeswalkers, maybe true name nemesis. But I want to be really death rate shamaning. And then there's there's this there's this third category that's like all. I want all of it. Where they're playing all of it. They have death rate shaman and lightning bolt, abrupt decay, days, true name nemesis. Thought sees and force of will, whatever. I want all of it. What do you think of the uh, the style where they're like this style of of uh, of Delver? The all I of think, it. Yeah, the all of it style. I don't like it. So my issue with it is, I, I think so much of the Delver mirror match is literally just can you get off the ground. So there's so much cheap removal and wastelands and stifles all over the place. And the game just comes down to, it often comes down to someone literally has no lands in play and is getting attacked to death by a flip Delver of Secrets over seven turns. And I think this deck, it, it does, it has a lot more raw power in it because you're doing it all. So the games where you're not being taxed by wasteland and cheap removal spells and days, I think this is, you are getting more raw power, you're getting more percentage points than maybe the, the team or Delver or Sultai Delver style of decks. But I think you incur some real costs in the mirror match by pursuing this route. I thought it was interesting, uh, and this is something that people had talked about a little bit, but um, the cyborg use of uh, Leovold, Emissary of Trest, which is a uh, conspiracy, or is it conspiracy or commander? I think it's the new commander product that's uh, black, green, blue, for a 3-3 legendary elf advisor, each opponent can't draw more than one card each turn. Whenever you or a permanent you control becomes the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, you may draw a card. What do you think of this in Legacy, of Leovold in Legacy? Um, at the Grand Prix, people were talking about just opening packs trying to find this card. I didn't know what it did. Now <laughs> I do. Um, it seems like uh, it's really good against sex with Brainstorm, right? Yeah, I mean, it's any. It's it's. There are some analogs to to Tireless Tracker, insofar as 
if you think the game's going to slow down a little bit and be about like removal spells and quality threats, this card has a very, very high floor and an extremely high ceiling, especially because of, of the cantrip stuff you mentioned. It's interesting that, like, unlike Notion Thief, like, if you just drop Leovold, even if they bolt it or plow it or whatever, you're still up a card. Yeah, it's, it's hard for this to miss. And some of the other cards, like, like Notion Thief, have fail states. It's also, it's interesting some of the little things, like how if you drop Leovold, it actually is very potent against things like Wasteland, uh, Jace the Mind Sculptor's minus ability. Uh, there's lots of little interactions that uh, that Leovold ends up getting the better of. And that's to say nothing of the fact that when it's in play, it's just putting so much pressure on Brainstorm and Ponder and, and the like. Is it a little weird for a deck to have access to green creatures and not to play Tarmogoyf? I don't know. I mean, you're exiling some of your stuff with Deathrite Shaman and Gurmag Angler, and it's not and Snapcaster Mage, and it's not like this deck has like a great variety of types. I mean, all your cards are just instants, and you, like, obviously you get lands in your graveyard, but you're exiling them so often. It's not like you're like filling your graveyard with creatures, and you have no sorceries and no enchantments and no planeswalkers. I guess you have Thought Season Ponder, so you do have sorceries, but you don't have enchantments or planeswalkers or artifacts. And everything in the deck is profitable against Abrupt Decay. You're either one mana or Snapcaster Mage generates value or immune. So I think I think Abrupt Decay being so prevalent right now is part of it, too. All right, that's fair. I, I also think one Gurmag Angler is kind of weird. Nah, that's perfect. Dude, the second one, like, you don't have a graveyard anymore. I don't know. I feel like this deck doesn't have a lot of problems getting its graveyard big enough. And it's like a, such a it's such a good payoff of a card. You have Deathrite and Snapcaster, too. I mean, the deck is taxing its own graveyard quite a bit. Uh, so I enjoyed Phil Gallagher's seventh-place list, with uh, which was a one of those white decks uh, with Stoneforge Mystic, but it's like, it's not really... I mean, they call it Death and Taxes, but it's but once it's mono-white, it's like... I don't know, it's mostly just taxes. And it's like, uh, Sword of Fire and Ice, Sword of War and Peace, Umazawa's Jite... Uh, as part of the the package, but the uh, some of the cool stuff was like Sanctum Prelate, which is one white white two two. Uh, as Sanctum Prelate enters the battlefield, choose a number. Non creature spells with converted mana cost equal to the chosen number can't be cast. What do you think of this uh, this recent addition from the uh, supplemental commander product type of action? I've never seen it. And it's a tutor target. It's important to note that it's a tutor target for your recruiter of the guard, which is the Imperial Recruiter reprint, except that it measures for toughness instead of instead of pow- uh, power. So these guys are all buddies with Aether Vial, huh? Yeah, that's part of the joke, is you put out Aether Vial on turn one, and then like you can vial down the recruiter and go get your Sanctum prelit and just be doing your thing. Or just get Mirror and Crusader, right? It's a... Uh... It's it's fine on all kinds of threes. Mirror Crusaders uh, good against a lot of the the you know creatures that people are playing. I played against this de- this style of deck with the new cards at the the team open in Baltimore a few weeks ago. It was my last round after in you know fourteen rounds prior to the last round playing against Miracles six times and was super super grueling games and it was nice to have a cruise control round against Death and Taxes to finish it <laughs> off. Um, but this was this was a real thing. I mean, uh, you know, the the burn deck is there are some analogs to spell based combo um, where death and taxes is usually pretty good, but uh, is often really bad against burn. Um, and this card was it was it could have been an issue had my draw been different. It, it's in range at least, and it's just another like low opportunity cost, high ceiling disruptive threat. This deck goes to a lot. Patrick, how did you do um, with your Legacy Burn deck? I was really excited to see your Exquisite Firecrafts in the sideboard. I thought it was I, like... I kind of like really want to play Legacy just having seen your deck list. It was fun. I, I went 9-6, and six, um, which is not great, but whatever. Um, I went 2-4 and four against Miracles, and two of those losses were just rust. Like, the game was in the margin. I didn't just I just didn't play well enough. Um, but I did go 3-0 and oh against Sultai decks, 2-0 and oh against Elves... Um, you know, a lot of the matchups felt very, very good, but I was just not in game shape uh, enough to play the matches against Miracles proficiently. Why did you only play Mountains? Um, so I didn't want to play Grim Lava Mancer. 
I just didn't think the card was very good. Um, and in leg, I, I was sideboarding all. I was only sideboarding the searing effects. And in Legacy, Searing Blood is about as good as Searing Blaze. There aren't that many three toughness threats. The downside is they get to fizzle your removal spell sometimes, but that's not a huge cost. Um, and Stifle is a card that's fairly popular, and your life total is a resource in some matchups. And especially with Eidolon and the Great Rebel and Flame Rift in the deck, I just wasn't interested in taking points for little upside. What do you think of the use of Batter Skull on the sideboard, by the way? That's the one other question I wanted to mention about Phil Gallagher's deck, which is a stark departure from most of the uh, Stoneforge Mystic decks we see in Legacy. Uh, I'm a big fan. I think the I play I play Stoneforge Mystic on two. It survives. Then I put in a Batter Skull, and it mattered that it was Batter Skull instead of any other piece of equipment. Is much rarer than the games where you get it, your Stoneforge dies, and then you die with it in your hand. Or you just draw a random batter skull and can never do anything with it. <laughs> so I like that all the equipment game one is just, if my Stoneforge dies, that's fine. I can still cast it and play Magic. And then for the Abrupt Decay matchups or for some random decks that, that just cannot beat a batter skull you have in the board. Well, awesome, man. Uh, legacy aside, which obviously there's all sort, there's always <laughs> there's always like a whole thing going on with Legacy. But uh, we are in interesting times in Standard with uh, the beginning of a little bit of a stretch before uh, before the next set drops um, and uh, potentially an opportunity for anybody who wants to try to challenge the notion of it being a two-deck a two format. Um, I'm excited to see where it goes, uh, and I'm hoping that it goes to, yeah, there's something that can challenge a two-deck format. What do you think, man? I'm in the market. I, I think the the energy combo-ish beatdown decks are promising. I think Marty Vehicles and uh, Sahili Ride decks are very, very good at blocking. And I think that uh, a low curve with a, a combo finish that involves Trample to play over the top of blockers, uh, to me, is a promising path. I would start there. Uh, one of the decks that I lost to at the Grand Prix was, in fact, the green-red energy uh, aggro combo. That's not really that that compelling though since you lost to everyone oh i lost to everyone oh, i lost to combustible if it wasn't that guy it would, it would, if it wasn't that guy it would have been a different it would have just been a different deck right? uh, okay man it, it it's not <laughs> uh so thanks a lot for uh for joining us this week peace sully um even yeah, without... thank you so much man it's been a blast yeah all beats aside this was really fun and uh you know with me in the city hopefully we can do this a little bit more often so uh just uh Normally, we're, we're uh, top of a podcast, even without P. Sully. We're top of a podcast everywhere on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Patreon. Uh, to that end, I just want to shout out to Sebastian Rover from Patreon. Thanks, man. Uh, thanks for supporting us, and, and thanks to everyone who, uh, who supports the podcast. Uh, if you like it, if you, uh, if you like P. Sully being on this episode, hey, subscribe uh, and uh, never miss an episode. You'll or, here. or, or, without any credit, just donate a little bit of your time to your community, make the world a better place, and P. Sully's heart will feel it. And that'll be thanks enough. Yeah, it's, it, it doesn't take much. Just, <laughs> just, just, just give me a little bit in some direction. <laughs> uh, see you guys next week. Thanks, Patrick. All right, Bye-bye. take care. Untapped phase, your core trapped in amber stasis phase. Lost a lot of friends, got left behind. Had to find a way not to lose my mind. Trapped in a vault with.